Yeah, that's me. I'm Ian. Um, I've recently moved to Sheffield, uh, come up from London, um, and delighted to be back in the north. Um, at the end of the presentation, um, I'm going to come back to three questions I'd like to ask you this morning. Firstly, what do you like having done for you? Secondly, what do you like doing with others? And thirdly, what do you like doing by yourself? So take a moment to take those in, jot them down if you like. Um, I'll be calling out um, for a bit of audience participation later, and we'll talk about those. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, uh, the obligatory who I am, what I'm interested in, um, how I think we're going about designing new services, or magic, as I'm calling it now, um, how our tools can limit us in that, um, and how I think we need to find ways to do um, of less doing to people and more doing with people, which probably explains my relationship with the co-op. Um, so, um, as you heard, I originally um, spent the last sort of five or six years um, very involved with a good friend of mine, Ivo, getting something called Good Gym up and running all across the UK. Um, the premise of Good Gym is that traditional gyms are totally bonkers. Uh, you often will go to some dark basement somewhere, um, start running nowhere on this treadmill, or worse still, lifting things in the corner of a room that, that really don't seem to need lifting. Um, and so <laughs> the idea was that all this latent energy could be put to much, much better use. Um, so what we did um, was create ways for people to come together, run, and put that energy to use in their communities. Um, that will often take the form of weekly group runs, where groups will gather, um, 20 or so people run to perhaps a local school, paint a classroom, weed beds at a care home. Um, this is uh, actually down in London, lots of turning manure at city farms, always a popular task. Um, uh, and then also what we'll do is we'll pair up uh, individual runners with um, isolated older people, um, the coaches, because uh, it's those people that provide the motivation to get out each week and do a run. Um, so that was good, Jim. I'm pleased to say it's running now. Uh, we're up to about 30 or so areas across the UK and it continues to grow. So I think it's kind of interesting seeing how people want to arrange themselves in new ways. Um, but most recently, I've joined Co-op, Co-op Digital. Um, platinum sponsor, <laughs> um, which may explain my being here. <laughs> um, what do we do? Uh, uh, well, the co-op has been around a while. 1844, these are the Rochdale pioneers, um, all came together. Um, and of course, being um, back in 1844, this means that we're six years older than California. Um, I'm proud to say, six years older than the valley. Um, and actually, um, what's exciting is I think we've been an innovator for most of that time. Um, these are some of the firsts, uh, so the first retailer to have scales in the stores, the first self-service stores, um, and various other bits and pieces. And these were all tackling um, quite serious needs at the time, or inequalities. Um, the first retailer to have scales in stores were because um, people were being ripped off with weights and measures. Um, uh, business owners would be cutting um, flour with uh, chalk or sawdust um, in a bid to raise profits. So, yeah, always a history of sort of tackling um, the inequalities that we saw people coming together to try and do that. And we're not afraid to be radical. So, based on principles of open membership and democratic control. And I think this is a quote by Katerina Fake, um, and it's a wonderful uh, quote. I think she says, you can tell what a company's values are by what, they, um, by what they focus on and what they take the time to build. So, you know, it's all well and good sort of saying, we are this thing. But when you look at what these companies are doing, I think that's really a reflection of what their, what their ambition is and um, what their values are. So we're starting to ask, what do you get if you add membership, cooperation, and the internet? Um, what are the future digital services where cooperation is a competitive advantage? Um, this is the team I work with, a lovely bunch of folk. Um, and we've been exploring a huge range of areas because I think, um, you know, uh, any modern service now, I think, would probably involve elements of cooperation. So we've been um, running little experiments to look at where we might move, um, whether that's in energy, community energy organisations, sort of, uh, the grid, the complete shift that's going to happen there. Um, obviously, high streets changing, care, connected devices, uh, some of the um, stuff in the homes, privacy and data, and a little bit around insuring things too. Um, so sometimes 
we use design sprints to explore what these services could be. So I'm curious, are people in the room who might identify as designers, perhaps? Okay, a couple, a few people who are sort of um, design-based, mostly technologists, then it sounds like. So let's see um, how much of this is familiar. But the way we've been approaching things is we build prototypes to test our assumptions and put them in front of real people to learn what works and what doesn't and what to do next. So um, perhaps as hackers, it's a similar thing, right? You sort of make something quickly to get it out there and look at how it responds and, and, and judge what to do next. And I think that's the thing now. We can do this with software. We can build things incredibly fast. It can be sort of smoke and mirrors to some extent and see the impact it has. That's the kind of approach we take. So to give you an example, um, we have an electrical uh, supplier, Co-op Electrical, and they saw how people were getting ripped off renting washing machines. Um, you might be familiar with people like Bright House um, on the high street. Um, and uh, it turns out to be incredibly expensive. I've got my opinions on this sort of thing. But um, essentially, you know, um, if you're um, struggling financially, you could rent a washing machine. When you start to get out of debt, perhaps you then start to get sold other things. I can only pay for it in store. I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, I, I sort of take issue with these sorts of organizations. And I think there might be interesting new ways to tackle that. So. We started to wonder whether people would sign up for a subscription service for washing um, and quickly put together a website called Washify. So for four pound a week, you'd get a washing machine. Um, should it break, repairs within two days and we could tie in with a regular delivery of laundry liquid or something. Um, you know, subscription services are pervasive in music or film and, uh, and I think we'll start to see more of this sort of thing. So uh, it was a way to sort of test this. And we thought there might be three potential markets, landlords, people who don't have the cash to buy um, machines up front, and people who are constantly moving around a lot. So we started trying to research with landlords um, and put an ad out in Landlord Zone, a riveting read, but it does reach 120,000 landlords. Um, so there, it's just a case of sort of fairly um, uh, nondescript advert, just offering some time to speak to them. Um, and we invited them to have a look at a website that we'd made about this proposition. Um, watch them sign up, ask them how they manage their flats and learn more about that dynamic as people, you know, never rented a flat out, so I don't really know a lot about that. And next door, we'd be observing them and taking notes on, on what we're learning. So there it is at the end of the sort of prototype. We're all very excited. Will people sign up for a subscription service for their washing? Turns out landlords hated the idea. <laughs> um, as it happens, a broken washing machine is a fantastic excuse to go and snoop around your property and check, you know, is, is it being kept as you thought? Um, or you've probably got a network of tradespeople in the area that you use to um, manage these things. So, um, yeah, our first idea completely bombed. Um, but um, we were still sort of exploring this further. So we we're putting ads out um, on both Facebook and uh, Google um, and started printing flyers and hit the streets with the flyers to talk to people. That was out and around um, Salford, I think. And the Facebook ads and flyers didn't attract anyone. A complete waste of time, <laughs> incredibly depressing. You're there sort of speaking to people, trying to collar them. It's a hard job. Um, but the Google ads, in fact, really, really worked, worked really well. Um, and I realized like it, it was Quite simply, you know, you're reaching someone at the point when they're searching for something. So we wanted to find out a little bit more with, about that and added a chat box to the web page. And you've probably seen these sorts of things in the bottom corner of web pages that pop up and people start to sort of check you're OK. Um, but for us, it was a really good opportunity to speak to people immediately at that point and learn a lot more about them. Um, and what we realized is uh, that we were starting um, we were starting to reach people at precisely the time where like their washing machine's broken, they've got a pile of dirty washing on the floor, it's starting to smell a bit. And, um, you know, it opens up all sorts of other ideas. So if you wanted to build a service around this, you probably, the first thing you might do is provide a voucher to get it quickly to a local dry cleaners or something. But, um, yeah, I, I guess it's just trying to show how you, we can quickly build this sort of magic these days. Um, it was interesting um, li listening a bit more to the sort of connected devices uh, talk that Caroline gave last. And I think I come at it from a slightly different angle because I'm familiar with like WannaCry and all of the botnet 
attacks that are happening at the moment. And I, it, it doesn't seem to be a month that we can go without seeing all of these um, insecure devices being turned uh, to malicious use. Um, and people just aren't familiar with what's going on, I think, in their homes. It is just magic. Um, and I was curious, could the co-op help people to understand and take control of these devices? So to do that, um, another experiment we ran, we, we launched, well, we, we came up with the concept of this idea called Co-op Scout. And I'll show you a complicated technical diagram of how that works. Um, so Scout connects to your broadband router and effectively you connect all your devices to Scout. And in turn, it would be able to monitor the network um, for uh, both um, sort of, I, I, I guess it would be checking um, exploits and zero day or like posts out there um, uh, and being able to update you should you be updating your software on these things because often most people plug things in and just leave it. Um, so again, we recruited six participants that we knew had different devices in the home. So we screened for them up front and asked quite, quite extensive lists of all their software. And then they came into the lab setting and we were able to present them with a kind of mock-up of their home on a phone. So you can see this is how a dashboard might look in the Samsung TV, something's going on, and you can see it can send the audio data to a third party called Nuance. Um, so anything in the home is being recorded and transmitted insecurely. And you can sort of say, oh, I'm not quite comfortable with this. And we could show them how to disable it, actually take the TV offline. And where I'm kind of interested in, maybe with co-op, um, you know, join a few thousand other people lobbying to change this. Um, remarkably, everyone's like, holy, you know, <laughs> this, this is, I had no idea. Oh, I'm OK with it. <laughs> and I was just like, what? No one wanted to take their tellies offline. But there was something in this idea. This is something rumbling away that we're not comfortable with it. Um, and maybe if there's another kind of action, we might be able to take on that. So that was interesting. Um, these design experiments are all done in just a few weeks. So I suppose it's also about just trying to learn quite quickly in, in these ways. But I think the tools and the approaches we take do limit us in this. So I think it's all well and good there for products or services that are predominantly transactions in some sense. But I think um, where I get particularly interested in is how we might use software and magic to help people form new forms of relationships with one another. Um, so what if we were going to try and design ways that people may trust one another? Um, we worked with the insurance part of the business, um, and they came to us basically saying insurance is totally broken, um, both fingers in the ears, and that no one trusts anyone anymore, which is bizarre given the whole industry seems to be built upon something like that. So, you know, in, uh, insurance companies don't trust claimants, they put in fake claims, in turn it drives up prices, so those with real bona fide claims can't do it, and then all the sort of the other parts of the the regulators don't trust the insurance companies. So it's a real pickle. And I think in part it's because it doesn't really look like this anymore, which is, um, this is Lloyd's Coffee Shop of London and it's people of a mutual interest of trading, um, shipbuilders and the like, uh, sort of looking out and trying to forecast what's gonna happen. Um, so I was, we were curious whether the co-op could help people come together to ensure the things that matter to them um, in a, I suppose, a more lo local sense, um, a community um, insuring itself, and built another um, prototype. And you, this one, again, I'll somehow get the links out so people can have a look around at this stuff. But Protect Together was a way that perhaps a group of people might sort of say, we all ride bikes for a, a monthly subscription. We're insuring one another's bikes. And should something happen, we'll draw on that. Whoops, sorry. Um, again, so this time we brought people who lived in a particular block together um, and spent a day looking at, um, in a lab at how they, what they thought about this sort of proposition. Um, and of course, everyone says, yeah, I'll put the money in and I, I don't trust my neighbours and all of these sorts of things. But really, I think what I completely started to see was we were going about testing this in all the wrong way because I think... Um, we're sort of still in this transaction form where we might present scenarios and things, but we'd slipped into this um, state where we were asking people what, what they would do and not really able to observe what they'd actually do. Um, and we needed to find a way to test those new kinds of relationships. And I think we sort of see hints of this. This is um, Monzo, 
uh, one of the, um, it's not really a startup anymore, but one of the banks, uh, online banks. And they're investing heavily in the UI and the experience of the banking app because they recognize trust is incredibly important there. And what it's doing is it's meaning, but I think what it's doing is it's sort of, uh, meaning that I, yes, I trust Monzo, you know, I trust them as the bank. And it made me think, well, we sort of have it happening a bit. Um, this is Airbnb, um, uh, the, the way to rent um, holiday accommodation. Um, and here you can see we've got, um, on the listings, we'll often have profiles or feedback ratings. This is Moe's flat. Um, and he's had 14 ratings. And it's kind of interesting, but on the other hand, it, it's a bit like I was looking for a spanner last night on uh, Amazon, and I found it stark that we're sort of reducing these potential relationships almost to transactions now. You know, I'm going to sort of go and stay in someone's house, in, and I'm assessing it in the same way I might a particular spanner in a list of things. Um, and you could contrast that with something like couch surfing, um, which was the sort of predecessor to all of this, where um, on a profile page here, it drills into a lot more detail about a particular individual, whether it's their uh, education or ethnicity or beliefs or religion, or maybe it's where they've been or the ambitions of where they want to go, but we can kind of forge different types of relationships there. Um, and it's important here, I'm not uh, talking about um, sort of nostalgia, um, but I think, so there are certain things that these new digital services that we're seeing that are doing incredibly well, but I think it's recognizing that in doing that, the sort of professionalization or the transaction, the transactions of these things, uh, we're losing things, the ability to sort of create these new forms of relationship. And so to bring it back to the co-op, um, we print members' opinions on wine and beer rather than those five-star ratings, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, we have a group of, uh, we can call out to members to participate in different ways. And um, so there was a sort of taste, taste testing experiment. And in turn, in the local store, then the reviews went onto the bottles. And it was incredibly successful and incredibly engaging. And I think this is in interesting, but let's be honest, it's just like labels and uh, sort of in some respects, um, it's, a, it's the surface, I think, of where we might be able to get to. Um, so ultimately, I'm still grappling with how we do less um, of these things to people and more try and find ways of using technology to work with people. Um, and it, it was really stuck. It, uh, it struck me. Um, it's not just about the things we build, but how we might interact with one another. Um, so back in March, a colleague and I went to the Internet Freedom Festival, which is um, an incredibly um, interesting, it was an incredibly interesting week. Um, there we were able to meet with human rights workers, lawyers, technologists, activists um, from all over the world fighting for human rights in countries where sort of, um, democracy was under a threat. Um, some of them are traveling under pseudonyms, so you know, it's where really your, um, yeah, they're, they're, they themselves would be um, in a lot of trouble uh, should it be known that they're participating in these sorts of things. And at the same time, then, I logged on um, to check work email um, and was mandated to go and perform my information security basics. Uh, and it was this hilarious flash game. Like, who still makes flash games? Um, where I, the information theft, you know, like drag the boat of information security and go fishing for secure passwords. It's just like, this is totally bonkers. And, and the stark contrast of being with people whose threat levels were significantly uh, greater than what uh, the kind of information I have on my, um, my work device. And I turned to my colleague and I was like, this is absurd. <laughs> like, uh, we have to some, some react to this in some way. And of course, we could have done a monzo on it and made it flashy and uh, slick, and this could be delivered in a different way, but instead, we came back and we decided to throw a crypto party. Um, and um, I don't know if anyone's been to a crypto party before, but essentially it's a way to uh, celebrate and play with the kinds of cryptographic technologies that are out there. Um, 
So we made passwords using dice, <coughs> so picking up um, half a dozen dice, rolling them, and then you use them to look up words on these big, long sheets of dictionary um, paper. And of course, it's more secure because you've not used a computer to generate that password, you know, by bringing it into the physical world. So, and it gets people talking about what, me what is a secure password. No um, boat fishing for <laughs> random letters. Um, we played with Signal, um, which is uh, an open source piece of software by WhisperNet um, that WhatsApp uh, used. But essentially, uh, yeah, uh, with it being open source, in theory, is more, um, well, it's less, less likely to have been tampered with. It's less likely to be back doors into these sorts of things. Um, and then uh, used Tor and showed how you could visit Google and it might spit it out in Chinese or in Russian or something because you're kind of bouncing through proxies. Um, and so I think, like, you know, personally, I think encryption and anonymity is for everyone and that our privacy is incredibly important. Um, and that's why we partied with crypto. So <laughs> I suppose the point with this is it was uh, much more about trying to find ways to work with the organization rather than feel like I was having something done to me. So I think we can sort of explore those concepts a bit more. Um, but it gets complicated. So this is the design sprint that um, Google will present. There's a five-day uh, process to um, get something in front of users really, really quickly. And this is what we tend to follow a lot. Um, but when you're moving away from products and services with a very clear transaction and you're talking about relationships which are built on trust um, or uh, yeah, sort of social um, constructs, it gets quite confusing and quite messy. So I'm starting to ask the question, what happens when this sort of agile way of building software isn't about websites anymore? And I think it can feel really overwhelming. And how do you use Agile to build new types of relationships? And I, I think what I'm starting to see is it becomes about how you design the invite or the follow-up or you know, like the merchandise, the badges and things. These things all become incredibly important to create in the community um, that understands the vision, um, uh, the activities and the language that we use. So one little example at Good Gym, as I say, we called the older people the coaches. Um, and it seems quite insignificant, I suppose, but bearing in mind, this is Sheila, um, and for most of the other interaction, interactions she had in her life, um, she was the care receiver, you know, whether it was a uh, district nurse coming in or a social services worker. So for a moment to be the coach where she, she's responsible for Kevin and his well-being and his fitness, I think like, it can really transform how we think of ourselves. So, um, the language we use in the services and the magic we're building, I think, is really important. And so digital is still very much there, but it's there to enable the new types of relationships and not just transactions. So that's a little bit of a summary, um, a whistle-stop tour of, um, yeah, this, uh, this concept of why cooperation, I think, is even more important today. Um, some of what we're trying to do with Carp Digital look at what happens when you bring um, what is the role of the co-op in the 21st century amongst the Amazons and the Googles and uh, the Facebooks. So back to those three questions. Um, I asked you at the start to have a think about what you like having done for you, what you like doing with others, and what you like doing by yourself. But rather now um, than ask for individuals, I think what we'll do is we'll just turn to someone next to us um, and spend a minute or two just sharing reflections on a couple of those things so you can get to know each other a little bit differently. Okay? <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So, sorry, I'm not going to call for responses back now, but hopefully, I mean, look, as soon as people are able to work with one another, it's so much richer. If I'd have put the call out to you, I think we'd have had this weird silence and a couple of people would maybe tentatively volunteer something. Um, I'll look forward to hearing some of that in the break. And so just to pull it back together, I guess, um, I'm worried that the world is becoming dominated by these sorts of transactional consumer services. Um, maybe they're getting dressed up in these fancy new technologies, but essentially it's market share and sort of uh, VC return. And I think that often in the name of trying to do things for people, we inadvertently end up doing things to them. 
um, and all of the ethics and the values that are getting built into these, soft, these pieces of software are often coming from a very, very slim, uh, narrow view of the world. So our next challenge, I think, is to design new ways for people to work with one another, both in building um, and scaling this stuff, um, but participating within it. Thank you.